Hey, gearheads, and welcome to GT Garage Talk, a discussion about all things automotive. I am your host, Corey, and this week we are talking Rebel Rally once again. I'm so excited because we have some return competitors, return guests here on the podcast in Mercedes Lilienthal and Emily Winslow. They competed last year crazy as it may sound in a 100% electric crossover vehicle 10 days off road so many miles so many obstacles last year in an electric vehicle this year they made it a little bit easier on themselves by not only getting a plug-in hybrid so they have the gas power engine for a majority with electricity as a backup but they also got like the king of off-road vehicles in the Jeep Wrangler Rubicon. So entirely different experience for them here this year in the 2022 Rebel Rally. And I've got both the driver Mercedes Lilienthal and the navigator Emily Winslow here with me today to discuss their adventure and what made this year so unique for them. So incredibly grateful to be talking Rebel Rally once again. This time I've got Emily Winslow and Mercedes Lilienthal with me to talk about all things electrified this year. Not fully electric, but electrified in the Jeep Wrangler 4xe. How is it going for y'all uh, this fine afternoon? It's going great. Um, thanks so much for having us on the show, first and foremost. Uh, it's currently not pouring in uh, Oregon, so hey. that's a good thing. But uh, yeah, it's um, early December. It's crazy to think that it's the almost end of 2022, and uh, 2023 is ready to barrel down our door, whether we like it or not. So um, busy, but good on my end. Yes. Emily, what about you? Yeah, I'm so happy to be here again. Um, I'm doing well. I'm in the Seattle area, so we've been some snow for the last week, which I think is magical. I don't think a lot of people think that, but <laughs> I love it. So I'm doing good, just enjoying the end of the year and um, yeah, just kind of doing life. So all good down here. Snow is only magical here, especially after uh, the early snowmageddon in 2021 in Texas. Snow's only good here for about mm, maybe two hours, and then we're done with it. Uh, we're ready for it to be gone, never to be seen uh, for the rest of the year. So, you know, as long as we get one good quick snowfall in, I think we're fine down here. Yeah. <laughs> Anything more than that shuts us down permanently. Uh, snow again was no fun. But we're not here to talk about snow or New Year's or anything like that. I am desperate to find out how different this year's rebel rally was for the two of y'all because y'all came on last year to talk about doing the entire rally in a fully electric volkswagen id4 this time y'all still had electricity moving you forward but it was more or less a backup method of propulsion in the jeep <laughs> wrangler 4xe Mercedes, we'll start with you. What was your position and how did the Wrangler fare for y'all? Uh, once again, I was the driver. So um, when I've competed in the Rebel Rally every year, uh, this is my third year that I've competed. I've always been the driver. And for two of the three years, uh, the very talented and expert navigator, uh, Emily Winslow, has been my sidekick, my co-driver. Uh, so this year, yeah, completely different. I mean, you can't be more different with a Volkswagen ID4 <laughs> SUV all electric crossover, um, a little car, like a lot of people like to say, although it was a very mighty little car. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then you have one of the kings of the off road. You've got the, you know, the ever mighty four by E, you know, plug in hybrid, um, you know, the Jeep Wrangler Rubicon. So you've got a yin and a yang that is very, very, um, exact opposite. So you've got a, a you know, a heavy hitting off roader that can basically, you know, go up and over everything. And, and I want to make sure it doesn't outdrive me as far as my capabilities. So um, very different vehicle type. Uh, you know, it was very interesting because I, I went after the rally, I kind of looked back at all of our experiences, all the different vehicles we drove. And then over the years, it's like, wow, okay. So we first both separately did ice vehicles. So internal combustion engines. Then we did an all electric vehicle, the first ever and only ever crossover that's been all electric. And then we did a plug-in hybrid. 
So we've done those three, and I think we're the only ones to have done all of those three. And they've all been very different vehicles. You know, mm -hmm. she did a Subaru. I don't want to talk too much, you know, Emily, about your experience, but you've done a Subaru cross track a couple of times. And so, you know, we've done very different vehicles, whereas a lot of people stick to one main vehicle. And a lot of times it's the vehicles that they own. So we come from it with a very different aspect where we're like, hey, let's just get the keys and let's go. <laughs> so with a vehicle that we don't know anything about, or we might know, or we might have had like, you know, a minute in to say, hey, great to meet you. You're going to earn your name in one way, shape or form and let's go. Yep. So Emily, to that end, you were the navigator. You had an additional task last year of watching range and making sure charging was not an issue. How much different was it not only not having to worry about that this year, but being in a vehicle that stock could take on, well, it does take on the Rubicon Trail, uh, so very capable in its own right. Yeah, it was uh, very different. Both, both were so fun. It was a good challenge for the all-electric, just having to keep all that math, but this year, I didn't have to look at the gas range or the battery range really ever other than like a once a day check to make sure we're not running out so it was so different um and it was so fun <clears throat> I've never really I don't really off-road <laughs> which right. seems weird but I just really like to navigate so I kind of off-road in the rebel mostly <clears throat> and it was so fun to be in this vehicle that could just like I didn't have to worry about where we were going right. with the crossovers they absolutely handle it, the Subaru Crosstrek and the ID4 for Volkswagen. They handled the train great, but it, you have to worry, like, what is that rock where we, you know, really be specific. With the Jeep, it was like, I don't know, get up that hill. And it's like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it was so, so different that I could put that kind of one concern out of my mind about um, how to gently get the car somewhere. It could just go, which was great. Uh, this year it was a little different. We used the stock odometer on the jeep mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have an extra n most teams generally have like an extra screen that will do two to three decimal points and they're kind of for the navigator to mess with <clears throat> which helps you be really specific but through some situations we didn't have that so we just used the stock odometer so most of my week i was kind of leaning over mercedes <laughs> like trying to count things so she didn't have to look down and you know yelling out numbers so it was different but um it it's super capable and it worked really well so it was fun it, it can never be just completely easy for you there's always got to be some little thing yes. <laughs> there's always a curveball and I think this year yeah I mean Emily, Emily nailed it I you know for us it was we didn't have a terror trip I mean you know we did have a terror trip but it never was able to calibrate correctly and then her backup unit didn't work correctly and and so those of you that aren't familiar with what a terror trip or a rally computer is um, we're allowed competitors are allowed to have a non GPS enabled rally odometer. So basically, like Emily mentioned, you can go to the hundredth or the south a thousandth. So if you're looking for hidden checkpoints that you have to find and hit and then basically click your tracker and say, okay, I'm at this specific point in the middle of BFE in the desert to get points and the person with, you know, the teams with the most points within specific classes and designations basically wins. Um, that's a huge, huge deal. But if you don't have that rally computer, if something happens to that computer and you're forced to use a stock odometer that only goes to the 10th, well, think about it. You've got 0. 0.99 tenths of, I think that's right, math. <laughs> it's, it's early in the morning for me still, um, you know, of an opportunity of not getting that dead nuts on. So, yeah. it, you know, it, it, it took us slower. We, you know, had to throw away a lot of black and visible checkpoints because we just weren't sure. And they have wide miss um, penalties now. So if you're too far away, you can actually get deducted points. And so, you know, but we ran the rally saying, okay, well, that's all right. You know, this is our challenge this year. We've got an extremely capable, extremely um, you know, a uh, long range vehicle. We never had to worry about range, you know, total range at all whatsoever. We had EV when full EV when we wanted it and um, we needed to use it mainly primarily with low range and let's use it to our advantage and go as best as we could. And that's what we did. Yeah. So to that end, we'll talk a little bit about your vehicle this year, because that was unique to this trip for y'all and the, Jeep Wrangler Rubicon. Y'all had a Rubicon at that 4xE. 
So two liter turbo four with an electric uh, battery, electric hybrid system uh, packed into it. How often were y'all in quote unquote all electric mode going over obstacles or uh, did you ever hit that e-save button? What was your method of operation here with such a unique vehicle out there in this class? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so for me, we're allowed, we have one day of prologue. So basically it's kind of a practice day zero where we're allowed to kind of get to know whatever vehicle, again, most people have their own vehicles. So they really know their own vehicles. They've prepped them. We basically flew in, got the keys at the hotel and said, here you go. And we were off. Um, and so we packed everything, we ratcheted things down, but we, we, you know, not only did we get to know the vehicle's interior and, you know, as Emily with the navigator, where all the cubbies are, or maybe the lack of, you know, where she needed to store all of her pencils and her rulers and her map board and how she was able to run in her world, having to manage all those parts and pieces. I needed to know, okay, how am I going to drive it? You know, I, I did the first majority of the day in manual mode to see, is that going to give me better control? I mean, usually it does, mm -hmm. um, but am I going to be in hybrid mode? Am I going to be in e-safe mode? You know, do I want to do all electric knowing that it gets up to what lower twenties for fuel? Right. I'm sorry for all electric range. I know I don't have a ton of all electric range. Once it's depleted, I can, I can backfill a little bit of it, but chances are I won't get a lot. And I want to have that when the train gets really tricky, especially with I'm when I'm in low range, because I want to make sure to hear the vehicle and I have a unique opportunity to essentially have it at near silent operation when I really want it in low range when I'm on really off camber or steep or rocky terrain or something that's really loose and I just want to have that all encompassing you know mother nature just hearing all of that and not having to hear a big roar of an engine and so I basically I found out through that that me using manual mode was using a lot more fuel um, I talked to Nina Barlow. She was the one that she won actually in, in another uh, Rubicon uh, 4xE. Hmm. She won again this year with it. And she said she ran hybrid and she basically kicked it over and left it in auto the whole entire time. And based on what our comparatives were, she used half the amount of fuel. Wow. And I wasn't gunning it everywhere, but that was really surprising. I was easing it everywhere. Mm -hmm. But using the manual used quite a bit more fuel than what she was using. We were running the same train on the prologue day. And so I basically used it in auto almost all the time. I um, kept it in hybrid mode almost all the time. I kicked it over to e-save mode when, when we were experiencing um, or knowing when we'd have dunes coming up because then we would end up being able to have the battery, um, having more battery opportunity to help us with that and then have the low end torque when we need it. Um, and then of course, all electric mode, that is when we wanted to do it in, um, when I was in low range or when we had um, more challenging terrain when I wanted to make sure to have uh, the utmost focus and I had the option of actually shutting off the ice engine and letting it be. It's all quiet nature as it is. Yeah. So Emily, to your end over there, uh, we've already talked about not having your typical uh, odometer and tools over there. How did this vehicle work out for you? I'm sure much more spacious in there, given its blocky dimensions and size. But how did this vehicle work for you, especially compared to navigating last year in a crossover? Yeah, um, yeah, I will say the uh, it was it was very comfortable to sit in. Though you know, a week of I don't know ten hours a day in a car tends to show you if it's not comfortable. So it was really comfortable, which was great. Um, there weren't as many <laughs> pockets that um, the ID4 has like a huge center console I could use a huge um, you know thing by my knees and there was a lot of space the Jeep uh, not so much <laughs> they have a, a even more compact um, oh, what's that thing called right in front of your knees that you open the Club trunk box. <laughs> yes thank you so uh, much more compact very um, small. <laughs> so I assume it's that there's other components that they needed to put, you know, I don't know, behind the dashboard. So uh, I, there was not a lot of room for my stuff, but that's not a really a normal way to use a Jeep, I'm sure. So I'm sure for the normal people using it, um, but it was really comfortable. Um, yeah, I just really enjoyed it. I would have loved to have like my own little screen, but that's not something, you know, in that car, which is also fine. So I really liked it. Um, it had more space than I thought. Visually, I thought it was 
going to be really tight. But once we started packing it, we found it that wasn't the case at all. So next year, y'all just need to go in a uh, Jeep Grand Wagoneer, or excuse me, a Grand Wagoneer, and then you'll have your own screen. You'll have plenty of room. I know. To spread right, out. Right. You can even camp in the back if you get the L version. You'll just be living it up and looking. Yeah, yeah, the extra long version of it. I yeah. love it. <laughs> it. Might be tough to drive, but I'd love it. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that the the Wrangler, you know, I mean, it's it's been a long while since I've driven the four by E or even actually, um, you know, a, a JLU, a four door, and um, you know, they they live a lot smaller in the interior and they're very nimble. Um, we there were a lot of uh, areas where there was a lot of overgrowth um, and torrential rains that really had just you know torn up the landscape and a lot of washouts and so um, you know the, some of those trails are pretty tight so it's like sucking those hips and, and of course those those fender flares are pretty mighty but um, you know every time we we went through it was like sorry Scott sorry Scott you know our contact at a and Jeep, we're like, ah, you know, we, we're joking, being like, we should put painter's tape on the dash and every single time we're going through and we're, you know, hitting, <laughs> scraping accidentally, be like, sorry, Scott, sorry, Scott, sorry, Scott. Um, but, uh, but no, I mean, it, it was, um, yeah, I, you know, to, uh, to Emily's addition, um, yeah, but as far as the interior, not knowing, I mean, yes, we've seen the interior of, of a Jeep before, but not being able to pre-pack it, mm-hmm. you know, the 4 by e with a battery pack, you can't lay the rear seats down flat. So we knew that there would be potential massaging of how you put the gear in the inside and you had to figure out how you wanted to ratchet things down. Because of course, we wanted to make sure we didn't have, you know, you know, anything floating that would be heavy in case something happened and God forbid you sighted it or rolled it or something like that, that we were safe, that we had everything uh, secured. But they had a lot of tie down points. We ended up keeping the seats back and upright and we put all of our soft gear up front. Um, so kind of like our, um, you know, our overnight bags and things. And we caged it and we, we you know, put bungee cords, some really heavy duty bungee cords on that and ratcheted down the back. We won't talk about the crappy, nice quality ratchet, <laughs> ratchets that I bought <laughs> because they sucked. But other than that, those are far uh, gone and returned to the store. But uh, <laughs> And new ones bought already, but um, yeah, I mean, it was great that it, it held everything that we needed and we needed a lot of gear because we were, you know, essentially eight days in the desert, seven days of competition, over 1500 miles all off road. Yep. I will also say it had a, I don't know what it's called, not a moon roof, the whole roof retracts. Yes. It's incredible. It was so cool. And we didn't, we wanted to use it more, but it was really dusty this year. So it was just not a great idea but anytime we could use it we would put it back it was so cool i love that feature. emily you read my mind because i was looking through the pictures of your oh so gorgeous bright green <laughs> jeep wrangler and uh, i was noticing it looked like it had their marketing term is the sky one touch soft top or yes, something along those it's lines beautiful and, and I- I wanted to ask y'all about that, but yeah, it, it's not a main element of the vehicle, but nice to know it came in handy. And uh, especially like if you had had just the full on hardtop, mm-hmm. packing it as tight as y'all did, y'all wouldn't have had any place to even put the removable panels if you took them off. So, right. Oh, I, I was shocked. I mean, I, I literally, as, as you know, I mentioned, we, we walked up to the hotel and I'm like, all right, we get to meet the high velocity beauty. And that's the technical name of their paint color, that bright yellow that you see from outer space. Um, walked up, we grabbed the keys and I'm like, no, they gave us one with a rag top. You gotta be kidding me. So I was super stoked knowing that we'd never be able to really use it. Although we did. Um, a couple of times. <laughs> a, a couple of times, but you know, it's, it's great. Other than the rear door seal that let in a little bit of dust mm-hmm. that we did end up having some dust on the rear cargo in the base at the mm-hmm. bottom of, of the cargo area. That sky top had really sealed in beautifully. We had hardly any dust in the front. I mean, we had yeah. dust, but that was because our windows were down. <laughs> right. I was really impressed with that. Really impressed. Yeah, I was kind of worried. I mean, it makes sense that it has to be fine for rain to fall on your car, you know, but I was like, Ugh, I don't know. But it, yeah, sealed incredibly. It was really fun. Weird. Yeah, we had, tren- we had torrential rain this year. So we actually, we didn't have a major sandstorm like we have with the, you know, ID4 that we actually had to sleep in the car overnight, but we had the torrential rainstorm we had to go through. So that was fun. Yeah. So um, I have talked to another team, a team Brute Squad in their Hyundai Santa Cruz and had some fun and interesting stories from the two of them. Uh, Jill and Kristen actually did swap back and forth, which I thought was a very unique approach. Uh, They weren't the only ones doing it, but 
were the first ones I've interviewed. But what are some fun, unique, interesting <laughs> happenings that happened to y'all in this year's adventure? Oh, do you want to start, Emily, and then I'll go? <laughs> I mean, sure. Who knows? Well, I guess, like, first <laughs> day one is day one, right? We're ready to go. We're doing this. Um, we pull out, take a ride down the road, and then we see all the cars, a bunch of cars that had already left coming back towards us. And I'm like, oh, no, I know. We're supposed to turn right. I'm sure of it. And Mercedes is like, are we? Are you sure? And I'm like, yes. And then I'm like, oh, no, it's been a year maybe i'm to is my map wrong like then we're like no we're fine and part of the rebel is like run your own rally mm -hmm. she puts you on different tracks maybe someone else is doing something different maybe they're lost but it's so easy to panic and want to go with the group just as a human like they must know where they're going right. i don't even know who's in that car they may be terrible at this like i don't know <laughs> but instinct is like oh turn around so we did not and we were great and we were on track i don't know what they were doing but um we get to where the first checkpoint should be. It's not there. So then again, I'm like, Emily, are you? what is going on with your brain? Like, you're not finding it. Mercedes is like, well, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I, I know it's here. I can feel it. I know it. <laughs> it's here. And so I made her drive around in circles for like 45 minutes. And I was like, it's here. And then as we're about to give up, a, a rally, like a rebel vehicle, <laughs> drives up and it's I think is it Emily Benzi maybe I don't know one it's of the Benzie. one of the workers Benzie. was like it's supposed to be here the flag's not here and we were parked like four feet from where the flag should be she's like it's here it's here <laughs> I was like oh so that was a uh, first it like checks me like you're totally wrong you're gonna fail this whole week what are you doing right. and then it's like oh no no you're okay you have good instincts we're fine here so that was my, the first you no, know Whenever nothing like that. We yeah, nothing like that seeking feeling right out of the gate. Like, okay, it, it, what, what is going on here? Have I done it all wrong? So yeah, yeah. so it was. Oh yeah, yeah, but it turned out well. So that's good. That was literally, I think, at that point, I think that they um, said that somebody had stolen it, and uh, that's happened before, where we were hunting actively hunting checkpoints, and somebody had stolen <laughs> a pole or stolen a flag just to be a, mm, you know what. Um, but then it came out that the course worker never set the flag. So, you know, the very first flag of the very first day, the very first, uh, you know, uh, yeah, that part of the competition. So, um, but yeah, I, re I remember one, uh, this is a fun one. Um, we were way up high somewhere. Of course, I don't know where any part of it was because she just tells me where to go and I drive there <laughs> as best as I can. <laughs> so we were on a, a really tall, rocky single track on a mountaintop, uh, you know, kind of, you know, creaking and crawling our way down and, um, you know, really t uh, tight cliffside area. And then all of a sudden, bing, 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 and a couple of different um, uh, dashboard lights come on. And I was like, well, this is interesting. And one of them was the check engine light. Thankfully, it wasn't blinking, but the other one was service four wheel drive. And one of them was, uh, you know, traction control. Then one of them was uh, ABS light. And I'm like, wow, this is a Christmas coming early. This is, um, you know, there's nobody else around. Right. And, and I'm like, well, uh, okay, Emily, don't be alarmed. Um, the, the car seems to be functioning. You know, went through all the rest of the, you know, of course I was doing like maybe seven or eight miles an hour. It was a really, you know, mm -hmm. steep, craggy, <laughs> rocky single track. You know, of course you didn't want to go off a cliff. Um, long story short, I uh, basically, I, you know, troubleshot as best as I could. There ended up being a, a medic team further back. I hopped out, flagged him down. I said, I know you can't help me. I just wanted to let you know what's going on so that you're aware in case we go careening off a cliff, you know, that there's, you know, not like we would, um, but just wanted to make sure that they were aware. Um, and, uh, and so we basically made our way down. Everything seemed to be fine. The Jeep seemed to be running fine. Temperature was fine. Everything else was fine. Brakes felt good. You know, steering was fine. You know, I put it in low range. Everything was absolutely perfectly normal. I thought, okay, this is interesting. So made it all the way down into a wash and was able to gain some speed and said, Emily, okay, I'm going to um, test for the ABS. And I'm just going to see if the ABS works. I'm like, hang on. I'm like, hang on to your rulers and pencils, girly. We're going to go for a ride. So then, of course, I, you know, slam on my brakes. And then, you know, of course, in a wash when it's sandy, you can't really, you know, guarantee if the ABS is going to go off. But the ABS decides to kick in a bit. And I'm like, well, okay, the ABS is working. I'm like, well, what the, you know. So I'm like, well, let's just get to a safe spot. Let's get down to the next checkpoint. I'm like, you know, next bit is let me just check the fuses to see if maybe some fuses work themselves loose or something like that. And 
And I, uh, I, I ended up, we got to the next spot, popped open the, um, popped open the hood. And um, then Emily helped me find where the fuse box was. Cause of course this is not our vehicle. And, um, and yeah, and I didn't know there was another gal that, that came on over. She was with the white Land Rover team and defender 110. Um, great, great, uh, gal. And she came over and she said, Hey, she said, I used to be a mechanic. Uh, what's going on? And I told her what's going on. And I said, yeah, I might be the fuses. She says, she's, yeah, she says, you know what? She's a mechanic. She's got, I've got a gladiator. She's like, they're known to come loose. Huh. And uh, when you're off-roading quite a bit, she said, especially this generation, she said, just check them and push them all down. She's like, I bet you any money, cycle it on and off a bunch of times, and I bet you you'll clear them. And I said, yeah, I'd pass up illumination. That's my last one. So I didn't want to do that mm -hmm. when, of course, I'm cliffside up right. on the you know, top of the mountain. And uh, and sure enough, I went through like 100 different fuses, push, 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 click, push, 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 click, you know, and yeah, cycle it on and off. And OBD2 reader that I had, said no codes cycled on and off on and off it was totally fine literally totally fine and i think what well, that was day one too wasn't it or was I, day two? one or two yeah <laughs> one or two so but yeah so i mean but real life story i mean that it's it's those kinds of things that you just don't know but it's important to understand that hey that type of stuff happens it doesn't matter if you've got three hundred and forty nine thousand two hundred and fifty two miles on in your old toyota or if you've got a brand new jeep that has maybe a 14 i think we rolled I think we broke a thousand miles with that vehicle on the, on the rally. So mm -hmm. it's a brand new 2023. So there's, you know, different things. And then this is how you, this is how you test them out. This is how you learn them. Wow. Uh, what a way to learn of something that apparently <laughs> is a little more common in, in Jeep vehicles. Uh, what else do you feel like you were just thrown into Jeep culture uh, in this vehicle? We already talked to you had the sky one touch roof, uh, discovered the fuse situation. Were there any other quirks or features, to borrow a phrase, that really stood out to you from 10 days uh, on the trail in a Jeep Wrangler? You know, I think for me as a driver, I I don't have a chance. I wish I had the chance to drive Jeeps more than I do. I really don't have a chance. I'm with them all the time. I'm next to them all the time. I see them winching all the time, but I'm never really driving them a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they're more tippy than they are. <laughs> they're just so planted and you think mm -hmm. that you're like way off camber and they're like, nope, I'm just getting Sunday coffee in the yeah. middle of a, you know, whatever. They're just, they're a phenomenal off-road vehicle. I mean, they're rough and tumble. They're not like a luxury, you know, SUV, mm -hmm. like a, the new Land Rover Defenders, you know, for instance, they're always going to be like a, you know, hit them hard off-roader, mm -hmm. but they're so incredibly capable. I mean, you've got your, you know, your electronic um, uh, uh, sway bar disconnect. You've got, you know, low range, you know, you've got your lockers, front and rear lockers. You've got, you know, huge amount of, I think almost 11 inches of, uh, of ground clearance. You've got your, well, this one had BFGs, um, you know, uh, BF Goodrich uh, tires on them, which were really nice and knobby, which we run at home, the exact same tires. And it's just, it's just so dialed. It's just every time I get behind them, especially this is the longest time I've, I've, I've had a chance to drive a Jeep. It's like, you know, they have their quirks. Sometimes they, you know, have uses that rattle loose. I guess it is a known issue, but it doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. Ours happen to happen. So, you know, you might get a little bit of dust in the back of the cargo area, but you know what, if you have stuff that has a lift gate, you know, that has like a more of a, you know, those types of, uh, of, um, uh, lift gates that are two part one you get that with a lot of those types of vehicles so you know it's it's a jeep yes there are different things that would be little idiosyncrasies that would be with that type of a vehicle but you know what no vehicle is perfect but i think for this type of a rally it was it's it's like the king of the road it's the king of the off-road it's it's mm -hmm. you know so dynamically different in so many ways than anything that i've driven for the rebel before and probably what i've had after um, so it was just, it was really interesting. So aside from the little pieces, <laughs> now that I know, now that I know, <laughs> um, oh, let me pop into, I didn't drive during the week. Mercedes is the driver, which is lovely. Mm -hmm. Um, and so all week I was excited about the ground clearance. We never, I didn't have to throw any rocks the last three times. It's like, I'm out there throwing rocks out of the way all week, but we didn't yeah. have to. But then, um, the end of the rally came and Jeep was so lovely and let me borrow the, the car for a couple of days extra while I was in California. And we had this like epic, I don't know, desert storm in Glamis and you know, there were flooding and all sorts of stuff. And so I left after the, there's a, a gala the final day and you know, it's late at night. And I left because there was some possible 
floods and I just want to get out of there. Right. <laughs> so I was leaving Glamis and there's a road that you take that's on the side of the sand dunes to get in there with washes, you know, and I'm not a desert gal and I, I know in my head that washes have water when there's water, but I've never been out there in water. And so I um, left in the Jeep which was the first time I'd ever driven it <laughs> or a Jeep ever. And yeah. um, the washes were full of water, like rivers, just streaming into the desert. I was by myself. It was very dark. And I just kept thinking like, well, Emily, if any vehicle can survive this, it's this thing and it's going to get yeah. out of here. And it was uh, a little dicey. And there were some washes that were much deeper because of the running water than I had thought but in the end, the Jeep definitely saved me. We would, I mean, we hit some pretty big water and just, you know, giving it some gas, it got, it went everywhere it needed to go mm -hmm. in kind of a stressful situation for me as a new Jeep driver. So it was incredibly capable and just so such a great vehicle. So I had to ask you both, Mercedes, you've always already alluded to it. Uh, did the Jeep get a name on this trip? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh the name let's see we have we have a team name that was team norwester um did we name it yes we named it um shoot what did you <laughs> you did because you kept saying it was like oh jocelyn yes jocelyn. thank you yes oh my gosh you brain fart i swear to god yes jocelyn that came pretty early because it kept on jocelyn us around just a lot and of it. <laughs> I was, I was kind of joking around a little bit being like, oh, she's Jocelyn and this and this, whatever. And I thought, oh, that, that's kind of fitting. That's, yeah. that's a good name. So yes, Jocelyn. Jocelyn, the high velocity Jeep Wrangler. Very nice. Very yes. Nice. <laughs> so uh, Mercedes, you've already mentioned you don't get enough time in Jeeps, but you want more. You have driven Magneto, which is their fully electric uh prototype concept whatever the case may be hint at the future that did have a manual transmission you and i both love manual transmissions yes uh, we know you've got quite the collection of vehicles there yourself emily this was your first time behind the wheel of a jeep leaving uh, the rebel does this have you maybe going to jeep.com a little maybe investigating Ooh. personally <laughs> either one of you uh, yeah yeah, I got to drive it for a couple of days around town um, and with the off-road that Mercedes showed me that it can do. I mean, I would definitely get that vehicle. It was so comfortable. It was so fun. And I will say, I normally drive a Subaru Crosstrek, which is just a pretty normal, especially in the Northwest, such a normal car to have around here, right? But with every time, with stick 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 a manual Crosstrek, <laughs> which that is not normal, but <laughs> uh, yeah, and so... Every time I stopped at a gas station, somebody talked to me about the vehicle, which does not happen to me. I don't, you know, that never happens. But every time I got gas, someone was saying, what's the dirt on there? What is this? That's a cool color. What's this Jeep? So it was like, I've never gotten talked to about my car ever. So it was very interesting. So people love it. I uh, didn't have the right info to tell them, I'm sure, because I'm not Mercedes. But people <laughs> love it. It was so fun to drive. I mean, if I had the money for it, I would absolutely go for one. It was so fun. Yep, and that kind of begs the question, you spent a, over a week in it, it was the 4 by e they do offer just that 2 liter turbo 4, they do offer a 3.6 liter V6, they all also offer a turbo diesel, I know you haven't sampled all of them, but <laughs> did, did that powertrain really make an impression on you, was it everything that you would need in, in your daily life? Um, I think so. Absolutely. I think, I mean, you'd have to have a charger at your house. To me, up here, we don't, we have charging, but it's not as much as maybe California might have currently at like the, the groceries and things like that. So I think that might, but I mean, you don't, you don't have to charge it. You can just do it fully gas. Right. So, I mean, if I install a charger at my home, then I would absolutely, yeah, you can get 20 whatever miles to a charge so if you're just driving around town it's great yep. so yeah i really enjoyed it and it was powerful and there was no lag that i noticed on anything so yeah it was great 
I think for me as a driver, um, you know, with with it being a lot more torquey and, you know, having a lot more horsepower too than the regular gasoline derivatives, I mean, what is it, 375 uh, horsepower and 470 foot pounds of torque, I mean, that that's a lot. And that, and I think, and especially in the sand dunes and in some really trickier terrain, I mean, where you needed a little bit of speed in the upfront grunt, I mean, it really helped. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I can notice it, you know, especially when you're alongside some of the other Jeeps and, and you're like, I, you know, I wish I could give you some of my power, but I can't, but you know, I, I'm going to use every bit, you know, a little bit I can. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was definitely apparent. Um, I think, you know, as a driver, we had um, my husband, uh, Andy, he's also a, a journalist on his off hours. Um, and he, we both had a four by E when it first got released a few years ago and we got permission to take it up off road here in Oregon. And so we ran it in full EV mode and both of us had driven it. And I remember the throttle. One of the things I do remember was the throttle was really sensitive. Like it was all or nothing, all or nothing. And I was prepared for that. When I told Emily too, I'm like, I'm sorry in advance if it's kind of herky jerky as I get <laughs> used to this, especially with it off road, especially mm -hmm. if I'm, you know, need to kind of bump it up and over because I don't want to just, you know, kind of do that type of thing as I'm getting used to it. And there was a little bit of that as you start getting used to it, you really have to, at least to me, you really have to just be extra, you know, feathering it or extra smooth to be able to roll those transmission, those transitions a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, but once you get used to that, I mean, yeah, it's, I think that, you know, that upfront torque and that, that um, electric assist is really nice. Yeah, the torque number on the 4 by e is the exact same as the monstrous 392 V8 version yep. <laughs> of it. And I know I, I took out a uh, 4 by e with my co-host at the time and a 392 behind me. I had Scott Talon riding shotgun with me, the head of uh, marketing for Jeep. And I, I was impressed with my time in that 4 by e I, I've since gotten to drive a 392 I've long joked that the 4xe is the one I would buy. The 392 is the one I would take if given to me. Uh, yeah. Just given a, a blank check because uh, the sound of the V8, the absurdity of the 392 is yes. just uh, so much fun. Oh, and they'll sell every single one of them. I mean, there was actually one 392, the Dixie Girls. Um, there was one 392 that was at that rally and they competed and I didn't a I didn't have the chance to ask them if they ever ran out of fuel because that was my worry and that was <laughs> theirs too because but every time I heard them because we were alongside them a couple of times during the rally and then they stopped and then they took off I was like oh that just sounds so nice <laughs> so yeah and G makes it even better there's a button on the dash that can make it sound even better <laughs> that opens oh, yeah. up that dual mode exhaust <laughs> oh yes yeah and Emily they have they have like a silencer mode so that you can like not piss off your neighbors quite as much when you come home so yeah <laughs> yeah of course yeah. when i was there I, I was there in moab for the launch of it so i had a chance to take it off road in moab and and do that and i, and I don't even think that any journalist really messed around with it because of course they were sitting at the light going rum, 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 right you know just because <laughs> everybody just wanted to hear it <laughs> So that brings us to the end result of this rally for you. Uh, you may need to recap kind of how y'all finished last year, and then we'll kind of uh, compare that to this year. I know you already mentioned some of the uh, curveballs this year, uh, maybe ditching some of those invisible uh, checkpoints. But uh, how, how did – remind us how y'all finished last year in the 4 by e So – La well, last year with the VW ID4, um, mm -hmm. so we were the first ever crossover to compete in and also complete successfully the rally. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in standings, we were, what, I think sixth out of eighth? I think um, so. Yeah. So, um, which, which isn't too bad when you consider right. the fact that that vehicle, uh, I was at the media launch three weeks before the rally actually happened. Mm -hmm. They took one of those vehicles from the media launch on the East Coast, shipped it all the way over to the West Coast, and persisted to basically build that one up and sight unseen until, of course, we got to the hotel room and then, <laughs> and then like, got the keys and then had a chance to, actually, that, this one we had a chance to drive um, about an hour or two off. Uh, the beaten path with Tanner Faust. So he kind of did some driving instruction, which was pretty cool with us last year. Um, and then uh, with the VW team as well. And so we got a little bit of seat time with that the day before. So, um, but we were really proud of that accomplishment. I know that they wanted to bring that across the finish line. Um, they wanted to have no mechanical issue and that it just sang like a song it was great. Mm -hmm. um, 
We didn't have any tow backs. We didn't have any mechanical issues. We never had any battery failures. Um, we did really great. So we were very happy with the outcome of that rally um, and being the first ever crossover to ever finish. Um, this year, even though we had, um, you know, hiccup with the terror trip and then the backup not working, we, you know, were um, needing to use the stock odometer. Uh, we finished within the top 20 of the four by four teams. There were 46 total teams. So we're still really proud of that, mm -hmm. finishing the top 20. I think we had our sights set on maybe half that, but hey, you know what? <laughs> you never know. There might be next year. So, yes. um, you know, and considering that this is also, I don't think this was mentioned, this was also Emily's first time really off-roading in a four by four mm -hmm. as a passenger, much less navigating for one. Right. Yes. So think about that for a second. She's been a navigator a bunch of times, but in a crossover. So she's never faced a lot of the terrain that a, that a full-fledged four by four goes over. I mean, some of it she does because crossovers do some of it. But so I think that's a huge testament to her talent and to her expertise too. So, you know, roll that all in one. And now we're one of the few teams that have done both crossover and four by four segments and finishing within, excuse me, in the top 20 and then becoming one of the teams, I think the only team that has done ICE vehicles, a full fledged plug in um, uh, uh, hybrid, and then also the only crossover electric. Um, so that's something I think we're really proud of. I know I certainly am. Yeah. What about you, Emily? What uh, what kind of stood out uh, more so to you that we haven't covered already? Uh, being in, like uh, Mercedes mentioned, your first ever full on king of the off road vehicles, really, in yeah. the Wrangler um, Rubicon. It was really fun to be in the four by four class. Generally, when you're in crossover, it's kind of a little bit isolating. You don't really talk to the four by four teams. I don't know why we're all out on the same course, but it's definitely kind of a, I don't know. So four by four was fun to be in the big group of people, you know, having everybody have the similar things that you're going for. Um, it was, it was so much faster. <laughs> I, it turns out uh, I don't like fast four by four. I like slow rock probably, you know, technical. I, I like the slow, <laughs> so fast was um I just kind of on both really I told Mercedes like I'm just gonna close my eyes this is not a judgment on you I just don't want to watch this I'll open them in a minute so like you do whatever you need to do so it was very different there's definitely most of the terrain is similar but I'd say probably my guess is like 20% is much more technical you know you're going straight up a hill or something like that so it was really fun to see what it could do and to watch Mercedes, you know, navigate her, the car, the vehicle through everything. So I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the kind of the four by four crawling stuff. I liked that a lot, especially in the Jeep. Yeah. Um, yeah, I enjoyed, I enjoyed it a lot. I will say, I think overall doing crossover is more difficult because you have that extra stress of like, the car's clearance or if it can make it there's no two you know there's no low gears there's no whatever so i and i think if you're trying to carry weight on a car that's generally not as built for huge you know four extra tires in the back or something so i ha i will say having done all the things like mercedes listed the crossover was more difficult uh, the four by four was very fun though that stress just goes right out the window you know the car's going to be fine if you if I can navigate it and Mercedes can drive it, we'll get there. So it was really fun. I really enjoyed it a lot. Well, I thank you all both for coming on and recounting your experience. I, every time I talk with anyone that has uh, participated in the Rebel, that just makes me want to go hop in whatever's in the driveway and take it <laughs> off-road myself, which doesn't always work for me. Um, <laughs> but... It is y'all have had a, an interesting couple of years in the two last two vehicles that y'all have been in. I'm I'm excited to see you know what y'all do next if if there <laughs> is a next year how y'all one up it or make it more unique. You know, you're already talking to Jeep. You know, talk about that Grand Wagoneer and get you that third screen on the side there, Emily. Yeah. <laughs> I, I went up, I went up that I, I talked to them and I was trying, of course, a girl can try. Yes. I was trying for Magneto 2.0. I was trying for the latest iteration. I'm like, you know what, if you want to go big, go all in and let me try it. I'm like, you know what, just put me in it and let me see what I can do. And of course, I knew what the answer was going to be, right. but girls got to try. 
Well, you tried you, hard. You marry <laughs> the, you if you're listening. Yeah, you marry those two ideas together. They're already teasing. They showed us the fully electric Wagoneer concept that they're searching for a name for. Why don't they just call it Rebel? Give it to the two of y'all and let y'all dominate yes. yeah. in a fully electric Jeep. I mean, well. Fully go. electric Wagoneer. I'll get my naming correct here because they would shun me if I called it a Jeep. But uh, yeah, I think that would, uh, uh, there's a nice synergy there that I think yeah. would play out very well. Hmm. Uh, it's called I mean, the Team Norwester edition. Yes. Hey, see, you know, great things are happening already. And uh, Jeep, we better get that trip for <laughs> naming that thing. But <laughs> I love it. where can our listeners uh, keep up with y'all and your adventures uh, inside and outside of the Rebel? <laughs> well, as far as myself, um, my husband and myself, um, like I mentioned, we're, we're both automotive journalists. We do a lot of other things to keep us kind of busy and crazy and all sorts of adventures. Um, you could follow us via Crankshaft Culture pretty much everywhere online and then also via Crankshaft Cult. Uh, you could follow me at Mercedes Lilienthal. That's L-I-L-I-E-N-T-H-A-L. -L -E I'm also writer with grit on Twitter. Um, you could look me up with my name and I pretty much pop up just about everywhere online. And I'll link all of that down in the show notes as per usual. Emily, what about you? Well, I don't do any of that. So I'm just uh, <laughs> on Instagram as Dermy underscore cat, uh, D-E-R-M-I-E underscore K-A-T. And I, that's it. <laughs> well, I just appreciate so much. I've had a smile on my face this entire time. I, I wish like I, I, we could go through the entire event with you. I know I've seen a bunch of highlight reels. I've seen a bunch of pictures. It, it just absolutely looks like a blast. I'm so excited. Great people like y'all get to experience an event like that. And the team that puts on Rebel, uh, they keep doing it year after year. And it's just so exciting to see. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. You never know what will happen next. <laughs> so true. Oh my goodness. I, I am so jealous. I My hope with each and every one of these Rebel Rally episodes is that Holly, my wife, will hear them, feel inspired, and, you know, start leaning into maybe what it would be like if she were to participate in one year. I want to get her involved so much because every interview I do with a rebel I, I i just have a smile on my face the entire time it is such a good conversation it is such a unique event and really puts the vehicles the drivers and the navigators to the test and it, it's just fun and you never know what the curveballs are going to be here emily and mercedes had like the most capable vehicle that they've ever gone out in and still they had curveballs thrown at them and things that they had to watch out for and account for that they didn't imagine they would going into it with their odometer situation. So you never know what the challenge is going to be and how you'll rise to overcome it. But I am just so incredibly grateful for the opportunity to help share their story. As I mentioned, as they were closing out, you can follow them on Instagram, Twitter, all, all those things. I will put those links down in the show notes, consolidate it for you. So they are very easy to find. As for us, you know, everything is at GT Garage Talk or gtgaragetalk.com. As for me, here on this episode, until next time, gearheads, bye. Bye.